keep your eyes closed until I ask you to open them. So you're going to hear some music, keep them closed after the music until I tell you. So let's begin. Oh, I love to sing. Barney is a dinosaur from our imagination. When he's told he's what we call a dinosaur sensation. Did you say sensation? <laughs> I want you to imagine that you are subjected to that song day in and day out. I want you to imagine that it greatly aggravates you, but you can't do anything about it because you cannot speak. And I want you to imagine that you cannot move away from the source of that sound coming out of a television because you're in a wheelchair been left in your wheelchair in front of the TV set. I want you to imagine as you're sitting there listening to that annoying music that there is a strap holding you up so you don't fall forward because you have no control over your body movement and that strap is digging into you. It hurts but you can't do anything about it because you're incapable of moving your limbs and no sound comes out of your vocal cords. I want you to imagine that as the day progresses, you move from watching Barney to having your shower, which of course you need someone to do for you, and the person who is in charge of showering you uses cold water. I want you to imagine they get soap in your eyes, and again, you're incapable of moving, incapable of speaking. I want you to imagine it's time to eat and someone brings a cup of hot tea to your mouth and you don't like to drink the tea scalding hot but you know it's going to be hours before you drink again and so you gulp it down. You can open your eyes. What I asked you to imagine was the real experience for a young boy from South Africa by the name of Martin Pistorius. In the late 1980s, when he was around 12 years old, Martin got flu-like symptoms. It just seemed like a normal flu. But he didn't get better. He got progressively worse, so that by the end of that first year of sickness, he was essentially sleeping 24 hours a day in a comatose state. His parents were told he had the mind of a six-month-old baby. His limbs began to curl in. He became incapable of speaking incapable of moving. Three years passed where Martin was in this unconscious state, but when he was close to 16 years old, Martin woke up. He woke up in his mind, but not in his body. For 10 years, Martin lived as a mind trapped in a body where he understood everything going on around him and endured the type of suffering I had you imagine, and much worse. He was brutally, physically, and sexually abused by some healthcare workers. But incapable of moving and incapable of speaking, he couldn't do anything to stop it. So how do we know all these years later that this happened to Martin? Well, we know because of an incredible person by the name of Verna. Verna was one of the people that worked at the care home. She would go around to patients with her massage oils and she would give them massages. And Martin has later described that Verna was different from so many others. Because when Verna looked in Martin's eyes, she knew the eyes were the windows to the soul. And she believed, although he was not responding back like her colleagues were, she believed that Martin was aware inside but regardless of whether he was, she believed he deserved to be reverenced and respected. One day, Verna watching TV when she wasn't on her shift uh, had seen this program about this new computerized technology that was being developed to help, parent, uh, to help people who had been stroke patients who uh, were no longer able to communicate verbally. And this computerized uh, program was being developed so they could still communicate. And so Verna watched this program and she thought, 
I bet this would work for Martin. And so the next day when she went to work, as she was massaging him, she was telling him all about it. And all Martin could do was sit in his contorted state in the wheelchair, listening to her, not responding back. But she said, Martin, I bet this would work for you, wouldn't it? So she went to his parents, became his advocate. She said, I believe your son is aware inside. You need to take him for further testing. And so they listened to her. They took him for further testing and Martin became unlocked. He has regained the use of the upper half of his body. He enters wheelchair races. He can drive a car with his hands. He has written his autobiography, an incredibly powerful book called Ghost Boy. He has given a TED talk but perhaps one of his greatest accomplishments is that he moved from South Africa here to England, where several years ago he married his bride, and just a few months ago they had this baby boy. All because Verna had the eyes to see what most people did not. I wanted to begin this talk on, on narratives about abortion because we're gathered here because we have the eyes to see. We're gathered here because we know the preborn child is a human person, but many people do not. And as a result, many people are mistreating preborn children the way there were people who mistreated Martin. And so the responsibility of you and me is to be like Verna, for us to become the advocates of preborn children the way Verna became the advocate for Martin. And I want to talk today about a very practical way we can do that through the power of storytelling. If you even think about my main point that I communicated just a few seconds ago, that we need, we have the eyes to see what others don't, and we need to be advocates for preborn children the way Verna was, I could have just started my talk with that. I could have just said, hey, we're here because we know something most people don't acknowledge, and so we need to tell the world. But I think you'll agree with me, that point was made much more powerfully through the story of Martin and the story of Verna. So what I want you to encourage, or what I want to encourage you to do is think that any time you're in conversation with someone, if there is a particular point you want to tell them, pause and think, how do I tell them this point through stories? Because stories grip the imagination. They cause the person to pay much more attention. And so for this presentation, I'm just gonna give you story after story that I hope you'll draw on in conversation when dialoguing with people on the topic of abortion. One of the tasks we have as pro-lifers is to convince people that when the preborn child is in the one cell state, when the preborn child is a zygote just after sperm egg fusion, our task is to convince people that that individual is as human as all of us and worthy of the same respect and protection that all of us have. How do we convince people of that? Well, a story I often like to tell is one which references an old technology, but it's making a comeback, and that's the technology of a Polaroid camera. I realize these days we're all grabbing our digital phones and taking digital pictures, but if you think for a moment about that old technology that's often used, at least in North America, at wedding receptions, on, on the reception tables, and guests are told, take photos with the Polaroid camera. If you think about that technology, you get a camera and you get a stack of cards. And you put the cards in the camera and you snap a photo and when the cards come out, what do you see initially on that, that first card that came out? What do you see initially? Nothing. Was it really nothing? What else? What do you see? Someone said nothing. Black, you see kind of like black marks. Then what do you do? Shake you shake it, right? And in a few moments you'll be looking on the piece of paper at exactly how you'd seen what was in front of you. So I'll often say to people, imagine you have a Polaroid camera. And imagine you're going on a little holiday with your Polaroid camera to take pictures that way. And imagine you're going to where Louise and I are going next week. I'm super excited because my dad's from Scotland. I just came here from Scotland. I was there all week. And um, I'm really excited to go back to Scotland because next week I'm going up to Loch Ness. Okay, that's right. I know you're probably thinking that's not a real Scottish accent, but my dad sounds like that, I swear. Right, so imagine you're coming with me and Louise to Loch Ness next week. And imagine that when you join us for our tour, and we're actually taking, we're all signed up for a boat tour of Loch Ness. Imagine that while we're taking this boat tour, you bring along the Polaroid camera. Now let's imagine a couple hours into our boat tour, 
we suddenly see the Loch Ness Monster that my grandma many years ago swears she saw. So imagine you point the Polaroid in that direction because you're thinking to yourself, if I can prove Nessie is real, I can sell this and then make money off of it. I'll sell it to newspapers, magazines, I'll make all this money, and you're thinking about all the things you can buy. So you're super excited about this. So you point the Polaroid in the direction of Nessie, you snap a photo, and the little card comes out. Now, just as the card comes out, Nessie goes underwater. Will you be disappointed she's disappeared? No, why? Because you've got the evidence in your hands. You're holding that picture. And let's imagine you start to shake it, super excitedly thinking about everything you'll buy. And as you're shaking it, let's imagine there's someone else on the boat to or with us who's never seen a Polaroid camera, doesn't know how the technology works. They excitedly grab the card from you to look at Nessie. But when they look at that paper, they see those black marks. They think the photo didn't take properly. And so with great disappointment, they rip it and toss it in the lake. The guy in the back there would be upset. <laughs> right, imagine the Scottish temper comes out. I see we've got a ginger in the crowd. Gingers are often fiery ones. Okay, so imagine it's the ginger with the Polaroid and they get really angry at this person for destroying the picture. And that person looks back and says, it was just black marks. Why do you care so much about black marks? And you'd likely reply, it wasn't just black marks. Everything about the image of the Loch Ness Monster was captured in an instant. It just needed time to develop. And so it's that story we can draw on in conversation to make the point that, yeah, that embryo at fertilization doesn't look like you and me. The way the moment the image is captured on the Polaroid doesn't look like a few minutes later when it's finished developing. But just as the value of that image begins the moment the photo is captured, the value that all of us have today begins the moment we are captured, which is sperm egg fusion, the moment of fertilization. And we could say to someone, hey, life begins in an instant but needs time to develop. Or we could tell a story that proves the point. Another story I'd like to tell you is one that involves, I find when I dialogue with people, they will often try to say, well, even if the embryo is human biologically because the parents are, the embryo isn't a person. And they will say the embryo isn't a person because the, the well, a newborn baby has no recollection of their time in the womb. So they, they are not even conscious, they're not rational, they're not aware, so they're not persons. And so the story I like to tell people about is the story of Kim and Cricket Carpenter. Kim and Cricket Carpenter fell in love, got married, and a couple months into their marriage, they were driving down the road on a wintry night, got in a severe car accident, and they both almost died. Well, Cricket was in a coma for several weeks, and when she woke up, she had no recollection of the previous year and a half of her life. Not only that, she had to learn to walk again. She had to learn to brush her teeth again. Although she learned to walk again and she learned to brush her teeth again, she did not regain the memory of the previous year and a half, which meant she had no recollection of ever meeting, falling in love with, and marrying her husband. Over two decades later, Cricket has still never recalled those memories and fell in love with her husband again. Cricket went through a stage where she had a lot of anger, a personality that she hadn't had prior to the accident. Here's why I bring this up. Some people might say very casually in a sentence, well, she's not the same person today that she was before the accident. But what they actually mean is she's not the same personality. There's parts of her that have changed. But we know that if we look at the wedding photo of her and Kim, that that's her, even though she doesn't remember it. We know that if we go further back to her high school graduation photo, that's her, the same person. If we look back to her parents' photo album of her baby photos, again, we know that's her, the same person. And so what we see is that it's possible to maintain our identity even though we go through physical and mental changes even if we don't even remember a portion of our existence. 
we're the same individual, but there are features about us that might change. And so we can use that story to then say, in the same way, yes, the one-celled embryo, the late-term fetus, even the newborn baby, has no recollection of those stages. But as that individual grows up and let's say is 10 years old, we know that that 10 year old is the same person as a two year old that she was. We know that two year old is the same as the infant she was that she looks at in her photo album. We know that that infant is the same baby also in the photo album as is seen as the ultrasound photo the parents put in that photo album. Even though she doesn't have recollection of it, even though her personality has developed over those 10 years, we remain the same even when we go through physical and psychological changes. You can make that point or you could tell it through the story of Kim and Cricket. Another point as pro-lifers we often need to make is that although the pre-born child is weaker than the born, that that heightens our responsibility. It doesn't lessen it. Now that's the principle, but it's better communicated through a story. And I remember a few years ago that there was this teenager I was debating on abortion and she said to me, she was quite exasperated, we've been debating back and forth for a while, and she said, look, if you have a baby in one hand and you have a fetus in the other hand, you obviously pick the baby. And before I responded, I thought to myself what I recommend you always think when you're dialoguing with someone, and that is this. What is she telling me that she's not verbalizing? What's behind her words? And so I thought for a moment about a newborn baby versus a fetus, and I thought, any one of us could take care of a newborn baby. You know, if I brought a baby into the room and then I walked out, any one of you could pick the baby up and grab the bottle I left behind and feed the baby. But if I had a fetus in my womb, could any of you take the fetus out and care for it? No. So I knew that in a sense, the fetus was weaker and the baby was stronger. Although the baby is still much weaker than all of us, in contrast to the fetus, a newborn baby is stronger, more independent. So I thought what the girl said to me without verbalizing was this. If you have a strong person in one hand and a weak person in the other hand, you obviously pick the strong person. And the moment I translated what she'd said to that, I then realized she doesn't, can't even believe what she says because civil societies always put weak people ahead of strong people, not the other way around. But I needed to prove that to her. I couldn't just say it. I mean, I could just say it, but I knew it would be more compelling through a story. So as it should happen, praying for divine inspiration, an image popped into my head and it was this. A picture my friend had posted on Facebook many years ago and so I said to this girl, what you just said reminded me of a picture my friend posted online. It's the type of picture that as you were scrolling past you'd normally ignore it. It was just a picture of water, maybe a river, something curvy sticking in the middle, nothing, nothing interesting except my friend had posted a caption right above it and she wrote, my husband is a hero. And I'm looking at that picture and looking at the caption thinking, why? And so underneath, my friend wrote why. She said, my husband's a paramedic. At midnight, he was called to the scene of a car accident. A woman had been driving down the road, lost control of her car. It spun out several times and landed in a nearby river. When my friend's husband got to the scene of the accident, he saw that that woman who had been driving the car was sitting on the roof of her sinking vehicle, holding her 10-month-old baby in her arms. My friend's husband jumped into the water, swam towards the car, and then realized he could only take one person at a time to shore. So I looked at this teenager I was talking with and I said, who do you think he picked first? And what do you think she said? The baby. Now who do you think the mom wanted him to take first? The baby, because both the paramedic and the mom realized something in that moment. The mom was stronger and the baby was weaker. And in that moment, they instantaneously calculated that when you have strength and you have weakness, you put the weakness first. And the girl's like, yeah. And I said, do you agree he made the right choice, that the mom had the right desire? She said, yeah, of course. I summarized the point. Okay, it sounds to me like you think we should put weaker people ahead of stronger people. She said, yeah. So then I connected it back to our original conversation. I said, when you talked about the baby versus the fetus and, and how you'd obviously pick the baby, I said, you know, a baby is stronger and more independent than a fetus. 
who's weaker and more dependent. And since you think when you have a strong person like the mom and the weak person like the baby that you should put the baby ahead of the mom while still protecting the mom eventually, then wouldn't it follow that when you have a stronger individual like a baby and a weaker individual like a fetus that we should put the weaker ahead of the stronger? She looked at me and said, you argue really well. <laughs> she was almost perplexed, but I say that to communicate. That's the power of stories. I didn't just tell her the principle, put weak people ahead of strong people. I told it through the power of a story. Another example as it relates, if you go back to my point that um, if, we, if I left a newborn baby in the room, that any one of us in the room could care for it, you know, pro-lifers often make a similar point to the culture. We'll say to the abortion supporters, hey, a woman can place her child for adoption. And then the abortion supporter will say, well, that works if the baby's born, because if I don't want the baby, then I can give the baby up right away to a whole host of people. But when I'm pregnant, I can't place the baby for adoption yet. The baby has exclusive dependency on me. That's why I can have an abortion. Because anyone can care for an infant, but only I can care for the fetus. That's why I should be allowed to have an abortion. So whenever I hear that argument, I think to myself, well, wait a minute. She's right about her analysis, but wrong about her conclusion. Right about her analysis, but wrong about her conclusion. The fact that, indeed, the fetus will only survive with her body, that exclusive dependency exists, rather than lessening her responsibility, doesn't it heighten it? I could just ask the question. I could state it as a conclusion, or I could tell a story. And so the story I'll tell people is this. Imagine, I'll say, imagine you are trained in, in the Heimlich Maneuver. Now, is it called the Heimlich Maneuver here? I hear it's got a new phrase. It's called abdominal thrust or something. You know what I mean, the Heimlich. If someone's choking, you, we're all on the, okay, good. Not lost in translation. So let's imagine you are trained in first aid. You know the Heimlich Maneuver, and you're out for lunch with a friend, and it's a very busy restaurant. And let's imagine a group of paramedics are also having lunch in that restaurant. Now, let's imagine someone at another table begins to choke. Now there's a table full of paramedics. They know how to do the Heimlich maneuver. So do you. Several of them hop up and you don't bother going over. There's the paramedics there. Indeed, they help the choking person. The person's a-okay. Did you do something wrong by staying in your seat by not getting involved? Did you do something wrong? No, because you knew not only that there was other help, but that other help was actively participating in responding to the situation. So then I'll say to the person, let's, let's change the story. Let's imagine you're not in a restaurant, but let's imagine you're still trained in first aid and you're really good at the Heimlich maneuver. Let's imagine you're eating with a friend at your home. And let's imagine no one is home but you and your friend. And let's imagine as your friend is eating lunch, your friend begins to choke. Now remember, you're trained in the Heimlich Maneuver. You know exactly what to do. Let's imagine you don't do it. You just sit there like you did in the restaurant in the first scenario. And let's imagine they choke and die. Have you done something wrong now? Yes. So then I'll ask the abortion supporter, having told the story, what's the difference between the first variation of the story and the second? The difference was that many could help in the first case but only you could help in the second case. And the fact that only you could help actually heightened your responsibility. It didn't lessen it. So what stories can we tell to make the pro-life principle more acceptable in people's minds? The other day, uh, Emmett kindly got me into a, a Catholic high school and I gave a, a presentation to some teenagers. And in the course of the discussion, one of the students asked, if the mother's life was in danger, what do you do? Is abortion allowed then? And so I answered the question by also drawing on a story. First, I communicated the principle. I said, well, since I've gone through the facts that the preborn child is human, then it means the child is equal to the mom. So we don't put the mom ahead of the baby nor below the baby. We see we've got two equal human beings. How do I protect them both? 
And I said to her, sometimes when we intervene, we're able to protect both of them. But sometimes we lack the technology to save the baby because the baby's particularly small and again, dependent on the mom's body. But not having the technology to save the baby is not the same thing as directly and intentionally targeting the baby's body for destruction and death. I said, that's what abortion does. And that would always be wrong. So when a woman's life is in danger, it's wrong to do that. It's wrong to take that path to achieve the end of saving the mom's life. But just because I'm saying that avenue is not open to us, it doesn't mean there aren't other things we can do to save the mom's life. And then I told my story. I said, imagine that you're driving home after school today and there's a very particular path that your parents always take to get to your family home. But let's imagine when you get close by, there's a sign up that says road closed detour ahead. Now Emmett told me you guys use other language here. Where's Emmett? Diverted traffic. Diverted traffic, right. Say it with an Irish accent. So imagine as you're driving home, there's a sign up that says road closed, diverted traffic. And so you can no longer take your normal path to get home. Does that mean you're not gonna get home that night? No, you're gonna get home, but you're gonna take this road and then that road and a few more turns and a few more turns, but you eventually get home. So the point is that although one road is closed, that there are other roads that we can take. At that same event, a student said to me, shared with me a personal story. She said, my aunt had an abortion because she was told that her baby was dead. Now it's interesting when people, oh no, at first she said she was told, uh, yeah, she was told the baby was dead. Now if the baby was truly dead, then it's not an abortion. Of course, you, you may need to remove the child if the mom isn't um, kind of entering into labor naturally, but if the child is dead, you're not inflicting death. But as I spoke with her a little further, she then said, well, my aunt was told the baby wouldn't live more than a couple days. So then it's like, okay, well then if the baby could live at least for a couple days after birth and the baby's not dead up to that point. And as we talked even further, it became clear. She said to me, well, and the baby didn't have a brain. And I said, um, was your aunt told that, she, that her child had anencephaly? And she said, Yes, and I said, okay, well, children with anencephaly um, actually have a very small portion of the brain stem. They just don't have the whole brain. And yes, it's very typical that when a baby only has the, the lower part of the brain, that when the baby's born, the baby may die right away. Some babies in that case die before birth. Some actually live for a few hours. There was one case I'd read about, I think a baby with anencephaly lived for several months. And so I said to her, I said, you know, what makes me sad is that your aunt was probably encouraged by the medical community that abortion was the answer to her situation because her child wouldn't live long. <laughs> and I said, I'll happily answer your question. And I said, I think the best way I can answer that is for us to do a little thought experiment. So I told a story I've told many times before, but it was new to her. And I said, I want you to imagine that you have a loved one who lives in France. Every summer you go visit this relative and you have a great time. And this relative calls you up today and says, um, I can't hang out with you this summer. And you say, why? And they say, because I've just been diagnosed with cancer and they've given me only four weeks left to live. So I said to the small group of students talking to me at this point about this particular case, I said, would you wait until the third week and the sixth day to fly over to France to say goodbye to this person you love? Or would you take the next flight out today and savor every moment of every day of the next four weeks with the person that you love? And they said, well, the second case. And I said, yeah, I said, I would do that too. And here's what I think this says. When we only have a little bit of time left with someone we love, we want to maximize the minimal time we have. We don't want to cut short the already short time we have. That little story identified the principle, which then I brought to the circumstance of her aunt being pregnant with a child who had anencephaly. I said, before your aunt was told that, she may have thought that she had, let's estimate, 50 years with her child until the aunt herself would have possibly died. 
But I said the moment she was told her baby had anencephaly and if the baby even made it to birth wouldn't live much longer beyond that, she went from having 50 years to maybe only the rest of the pregnancy, 20 weeks. I said, why would we cut short the already short time we have left? Wouldn't we want to savor every moment of every day of the next 20 weeks with the child that we love? I looked at the girl and I said, was your aunt sad when she had the abortion? She said, yeah. I said, how about when that, that day came along that should have been the birthday? Was she sad? She said, yeah. I said, you know, and if she had carried that pregnancy to term and the baby died naturally, she'd have been sad then too. And when the first birthday a year later came along, she'd have been sad then too. So carrying to term or having the abortion in this situation is not going to take the sadness away. The sadness will exist, but having the abortion takes away the gift of time. Having the abortion takes away the gift of time. We can say the principle or communicate it through the power of a story. I think when it comes to poor prenatal diagnosis, sometimes we're dealing with circumstances where parents are told the baby's going to die, but other times we're just dealing with situations of physical and genetic difference. And so what I want to do is play for you a video that tells a story. And I think it's a story we can draw on to communicate to people that when you get what seems like bad news because the child is not what you expected, it's possible to put on a different set of glasses and see the situation in a positive way. So let's take a look. The piece is titled Claire de Lune, Light of the Moon. In the darkness of his eyes and through the sweetness of his hands, when Patrick Hughes plays, it is the music of possibility and the sound of promise. How would you describe your disabilities? Not disabilities at all, more abilities. Abilities everybody hears and sees at every Louisville football game. To understand how Patrick Hughes and his father became a two-person member of the Cardinal Marching Band, go back to when the music began. Born without eyes and with a tightening of the joints that prevents his limbs from ever straightening, Patrick has been blind and crippled from birth. It's just countless the number of dreams that, that die, and, and my wife and I were devastated. We just asked, why us? We played by all the rules, we worked hard, we just didn't understand. Kisses for day. That heartbreak began to fade, even before Patrick's first birthday, from his first moments at the family's piano in Louisville, Kentucky. You could go up and, and hit a note no matter where it was on the, on the piano and within a, one or two tries he would find that exact note. By his second birthday, he was playing requests. Can you play You Are My Sunshine? Say Twinkle. I was just ecstatic that, you know, okay, we're not going to play baseball, but we're going to play music together. And that was, that was really exciting. Let's see how far we can run with this. Fitted with artificial eyes and placed in a wheelchair, as Patrick grew, so did his passion and his talent. He played old standards by grade school and blues numbers by high school. By the time he arrived at the University of Louisville this year, his musical ability on piano as well as trumpet was well known throughout the city. I said, Patrick, you need to be a part of the marching band. <laughs> and their reaction was um, just a little bit of a pause. My dad and I are hearing this and we're like, uh, right. I mean, how in the heck am I supposed to march? The next step was, 
working out what we needed to make happen in order for Patrick to be involved in the marching band, other than just parking on the sidelines and playing his instrument. I said, well, if Dr. Burns that impassioned about it and Patrick wants to do it, then by golly, I'll give it my all as well. So it was decided Patrick would play and Dad would push. As part of the 214-member Louisville Marching Band, a blind and wheelchair-bound trumpet player and his able-bodied father do it all together. From the pre-game drill practice to the march around the stadium to the halftime performance in front of thousands. Dad rolls and rotates his son across the field in mostly perfect formation. He'll sometimes end up pushing me a little quicker than normal, so that pretty much means, hey, he must have done something wrong, so he, he's got to hurry up to get me to the right spot. Dip. Spin. In order to be at every band practice, I'm too slow on the spin. And to sit beside his son in every class. Question? Yes. How do you come up with all the. Patrick's father works the graveyard shift for UPS. How would you describe a work day for your dad? Poor thing. Uh, he goes to work about 11 o'clock at night, Monday through Thursday nights, and then gets in at about 6 and, and goes to bed at about 6 and sleeps till around 11. By the time Patrick moves from his bed into his wheelchair each morning, dad is ready to begin their day together. He's, he's my hero. I've told him before. Uh, what he goes through, it's taught me that I don't really have any complaints. I guess a father couldn't ask for, for any more of them than the relationship that I have with Patrick. God made me blind and unable to walk. Big deal. He gave me the ability to the musical gifts I have and the great opportunity to meet new people. That's your fans, buddy. Maybe when they hear him play, they recognize, wow, you know, imagine the possibilities I didn't even consider when I saw this young man that I now know from hearing him play. So whether it be on a field playing the Louisville fight song or at the piano playing Claire de Lune, in a sense, the melody is the same. Patrick Hughes plays so that we might hear the music of opportunity and the sound of potential. It's a beautiful story, and as has been said, I believe it was Dostoevsky who wrote, Beauty Will Save the World. There is much that can be said about how we can use that story in conversation, but there are two parts in particular that I want to highlight for you today. The first part I think we can bring to conversations where we talk about a poor prenatal diagnosis is the power of perspective. When uh, Patrick's dad first learned about the disability, he thought, I'm no longer going to do sports with my son. And he could have just stayed in the negative state of what they'd never do. But he used the power of perspective. And those who attended my assisted suicide talk will know I spoke about this. I can't change what's in front of me, but I can change how I see it. So instead of seeing my son as a disability that prevents him from doing sports, I'm going to see he's got a disability, but maybe he can do music. And we change how we see from the negative to the positive. The other element of this story, and there's many you could draw, but the other one I want to draw out for you is, again, something I quoted from my previous talk, which are the words of uh, the late, great St. John Paul II, who said, suffering unleashes love. And it is so powerful to see the love of that father who works such long hours and would probably want to sleep longer, but doesn't so that he can participate in the daily activities of his son and giving him a whole new world of opportunity. The vulnerability, the weakness, the suffering that Patrick lives with unleashes his father's love. 
And that's how we should respond when people are coming into our life through the womb and soon out. That when these children are coming into our life with disabilities, we can say, how can this unleash my love? How can I step outside of myself in order to make this person's life better? And in doing so, when we give love, the mystery is we receive so much joy and love back. When I dialogue with people on abortion, another circumstance that often comes up in conversation, perhaps the most common one I often hear, is pregnancy as a result of rape. And there is so much that can be said about this. And again, just the other day at the school, one of the students asked, okay, all this makes sense, except if a woman hasn't consented to sex and she's now pregnant from rape, shouldn't she be allowed to have an abortion? And there are many stories that I'm going to impart to you today that are things that you can draw on and through the stories we can see the core principle. One of the first principles that I often ask people to consider is this. As unjust and evil as the act of rape is, as much as we in many places of the world probably need more serious consequences set in, in, in place legally for the rapist himself, is it fair to give the death penalty to the innocent child? In other words, is it fair for any of us to have to pay the consequence of a crime that any of our parents committed? And if it wouldn't be wrong, if it wouldn't be correct rather, for us to have to take on the consequences of a crime that our parents committed, why would it be fair for us to make the preborn child take on a life-ending consequence for a crime the father committed. Another question I think we can ask is this, will abortion unrape a rape victim? Will it take that trauma away? Will it undo what's been done? That's something my friend Leanna asked. I met Leanna several years ago it's not the best photo, you'll see a better one in a moment. Um, I met her a few years ago when she and I both spoke in Guatemala. I don't speak Spanish, so my talks were translated for my audience. She speaks Spanish and English, so she gave her talk in Spanish, which meant I didn't understand her. So when our first evening of presentations ended and we were taken back to the hotel, we decided to get to know each other as fellow speakers over a meal. And so as we got talking, we were mentioning different things about our lives, and uh, she mentioned that she was 37. And I said, oh, no way, I'm 36. And then uh, she said she had a daughter. And I said, how old is your daughter? And she said, 25. And then I did the math and realized 25 years ago I was 11, which meant Leanna was 12. And she told me that growing up in Mexico City when she was 12 years old, she was kidnapped, held for several days, and brutally and repeatedly raped. Once she was freed sometime later, when she went to the doctor, they found out she was pregnant from those rapes. And remarkably, when the doctors offered Leanna an abortion, 12-year-old Leanna looked at the doctor and asked him if having an abortion would take away all the terrible feelings that she felt, that if having the abortion would take away all the terrible nightmares she was getting. And so when the doctor had to answer honestly that technically the abortion wouldn't do that, then Leanna said, then I just didn't see the point. In one of her interviews, she said, all I knew that there was, was, was that there was a life inside of me that needed me and I needed her. And so Leanna carried through with that pregnancy and not only carried to term, uh, but parented her daughter. And when I think of the fact that her story brings to light that the abortion wouldn't have taken away the trauma, it's more powerful to share that point through the story of Leanna's experience than to just make the statement that abortion won't unrape a rape victim. Another point that we can make and then answer through the power of a story is to ask the question, is it possible to be grateful for a child who originated from an evil act? And to answer that question, 
I'll sometimes draw on the story of these three young women from the United States, Amanda Berry, Gina De Jesus, and Michelle Knight. All three of these girls, when they were in their teenage years, were kidnapped by a man in Ohio by the name of Ariel Castro, and they were held for 10 years. They were subjected to the most brutal physical and sexual torture, repeatedly raped multiple times a day, year after year. Amanda, on the left, got pregnant and was allowed to carry through with that pregnancy even though she was chained in the house and not allowed to leave the house. And so she carried through with the pregnancy, uh, gave birth to her daughter there, uh, raised her in the house until they managed to escape six years later. But she is so grateful for her daughter. She doesn't think about who the daughter's father is. She thinks about the fact that she's the mother. And in the book that Amanda wrote with Gina, they dedicate the book to that little girl. And they say she made a dark house brighter when she was born on Christmas Eve. That child of rape was not viewed as a child of rape, but was viewed as a bright light in a dark house. Contrast Amanda's experience with Michelle's. Michelle got pregnant five times in the house and was beaten each time so brutally that it induced miscarriage. And Michelle wept over the loss of those children. She did not look at each of those losses as, oh good, I'm not pregnant. In, the, in her book, she talks about staring at one of the bodies of the baby and saying, you didn't deserve this. And she talked about how badly she wanted these children. What were these children of? Rape. But she didn't look at it from where they came from. She looked at who they were. Another example of how we can be grateful for children who originate from an evil act is the story of J.C. Dugard, another young American girl who was kidnapped at the age of 11 and held for 18 years, where she was uh, subject to all kinds of brutality, including rape. She conceived and gave birth to two children in the course of her time in captivity. And she writes about how her children gave her strength. She writes about how she's thankful for her children. And to quote her directly, she said, the most precious thing in the world came out of it, my daughters. The power of story to communicate the pro-life message. This is what we want to draw on. But as, in, as much as we need to have a roster of stories in our minds that we can share with others, different tools that we can draw on in the right moments with the Holy Spirit's inspirations, you might forget a particular story, but then when you're in conversation, something will come to mind and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm gonna share this with this person. It's important to remember, not only do we need to share stories, but we need to be willing to receive stories. We need to be willing to hear the story of another. When I tell the stories that I've told you today, they're often in two settings. One setting would be something like this, whether I'm talking to a larger group like this or a small group, maybe a handful of teenagers after a high school talk. Another setting would be in a one-on-one -on -one conversation where we're just discussing and debating the ethics of abortion, much like as, as happens with the summer campaign, hopefully you'll all sign up for, Project Truth. But there is a time when I don't draw on these stories. And the time I don't draw on the stories is when the person begins to tell me their story. When they bring up that they've had an abortion or that they were raped or that they grew up in abject poverty. And when they start to reveal something about themselves or that my mom had this happen to her or my sister had this happen to her, but there's a revealing of someone else's story, I actually set my stories aside. And I listen to theirs and I say, how is your mom doing? Or how are you doing? What would you like me to understand as we've debated all this time and you've now shared this with me? How can I help you? What do you best need right now? 
and it's a setting aside of our stories to receive theirs. Another time I might set aside my stories is when I haven't yet been told their story, but I'm starting to sense they have one. So I'll have lots of conversations, very intellectual, we're going back and forth, but every now and then there comes a point where I can't seem to get through to this person and I think, man, I've got some pretty amazing stories to tell you, why isn't this resonating? And it's not that they've told me they're coming from a place of pain, but if I can't get through to them, I start to wonder if they are, if they're coming from a place of pain. And although I don't ask directly, I often ask indirectly, things like, I'm curious, where does your passion come from? Or I'm curious, do you know anyone who's had an experience with what we're talking about? Or I'm wondering, when did you first learn about abortion and what did you think then? And did your opinion change? Oh, when did it change? Why? And as they start to answer those questions, that might be when they start to indicate they're coming from a place of direct or indirect experience. And that tells me it's time to set aside my stories and listen to theirs. And I wanna really hit this point home by playing for you one more video clip. It's of a dialogue that happened on a college campus and it's an example of what not to do. Because this conversation and, and, and leads to other conversations, this conversation happens in a setting where one of the participants revealed her story. And rather than those who heard it, sitting with it and having empathy and compassion, they decided to keep going forward on their mission. So let's take a look. And you cannot, you can't say. I'm not it's trying to wrong. say I do. I'm not trying to say I do. You're trying to say the choice that I made was incorrect because there was another choice that for some reason looks better to you. This reason being it doesn't, God. It doesn't look better at first. But you have to look past the pain. You have to look past the suffering. You have to look past it. Right, so I have years of suffering to look forward to if I had made that other choice. So you're, I have the rest of my the, life to look forward to. suffering right. all by itself. And you're yeah, looking, suffering and again, does that to you. And looking, and when again, you have a lot of suffering, it's not like it stays on the side. It's usually right in front of your face. It is, and it's hard. But you're always looking at yourself in this, in this situation. You have not thought once about that baby and how... I was a, a baby at that age. You were 13. Yes, I was. That's not a baby. I'm yeah. sorry, I was a teenager. Okay. Does that make you feel better? No, it doesn't. Would it, be, would it have been better if I was five when it happened? So I could actually tell you that I was more babyish? You wouldn't have gotten pregnant. <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten pregnant if I wasn't raped. <laughs> well, okay, but see, the point is you guys are getting off on all kinds of different tangents. The bottom line is it's not right to kill unborn children, regardless of any of the it's other issues. It's not killing. It's a surgical oh, procedure yes, it to remove cells. That's what I well, it's alive when you start. It's dead when you stop. Then what is it's it? It's not alive on its own. It's alive in my body. So It can't live without me, is? so therefore it's up to me to make that choice. Well, it's an individual human being. It's an individual. It's not an individual human being because it doesn't have its own lungs. Whose DNA brain. does it have? It has a combination. No, no, no. It has its own individual it's DNA. It's not your DNA. <laughs> if it were your DNA, then it would be your body. So it has a combination of the mother and the father. Right. So you're saying it's different than yours, right? I don't really give a rat's ass about but the DNA. But that's the whole crux of the issue. No, the question is. See, everybody's issue, saying, is it, uh, is that there is it a choice? Make choices. Choice There's to do what you want to do with choices. your own body. Right? And you're saying that the reason they have is just complete crap. That there's never a reason to do this. And I'm telling you, I am a living example of why abortions should be legal, of why abortions should be available to any woman who needs them. So she can live her life. Well, those are all wonderful points, but it's still wrong to kill. Unborn human beings. Who says it's wrong? Oh, I do. And? That's your opinion. And what most is, of these other people do. Right, and I bet you those people in this camp would agree right, with Right, but see, they don't understand. See, they're saying that it's a it's a woman's choice to do what she wants to do with her own body. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. But a, an unborn fetus is not your body. It has different DNA than you. See, if it were your body, every person body. has it's DNA. It's living in my womb, right? right? Just listen is it renting out a room? For listen to my one point. Every person has DNA in their body, and DNA is identical from cell to cell. I was taught that in biology class here at Canada. So, if it's your body, it'll have your DNA. 
if it's somebody else's body, it'll have different DNA. That's a biological fact. Why do you care so much about DNA? Why do you care so much about DNA? If we pause and remember what I said at the beginning and we ask ourselves, what are they communicating but not verbalizing? What she was really saying is, why don't you care about me? Because the guys lost sight of the person in front of them. The way some people in the care home lost sight of the person of Martin in front of them. And the way many people in our culture lose sight of the baby in the womb. And we need the eyes to see and the courage to advocate for the baby in the womb. But we also need the eyes to see the person right in front of us. And we need the wisdom and discernment to know when to set aside our stories in order to sit with them in theirs. Because at the end of the day, the pro-life goal is not merely to win an argument, but to also win the person we're arguing with. And very sadly, that young woman got lost by that crowd. I'd like to wrap everything up, ending where I began in reference to Martin Pistorius. In one of his radio interviews, he said, I think being seen and having another person validate your existence is incredibly important. And so it's my hope that at the end of the day, your takeaway from this presentation is that you see and validate not only the pre-born child through the stories you tell advocating for them, but you see and validate the born person whose stories you receive. Thank you very much. Um, so it's a hypothetical story that I had heard. Um, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I just wondered what your answer to it would be. And it was that um, if you cared so much about the embryo, the zygote, the, the human fetus, more than a child, hypothetically, if you were in an IVF laboratory mm. and there was thousands and thousands of test tubes, you've had this before, yes, I can tell. Yes, but they may not have, so keep going. Uh, thousands <laughs> of test tubes. And a little five-year-old wandered in and the building caught fire. Would you grab hundreds of test tubes to save hundreds of lives? Or would you grab the five-year-old? And I think most people would say you'd go for the five-year-old because it's there and it's a living person in front of you you can see. I just wonder what your response would be. Yes, great, great question. And so what I always do again is I pause and say, what are they communicating but not verbalizing? And so what they're communicating is, I'm creating a scenario where I'm testing you pro-lifers. You say you're all about the embryos, but if you don't pick these embryos in their, in their tubes in the IVF clinic and you pick the five-year-old, then ha, you don't really care about the embryo and abortion's okay. But that conclusion does not follow even if I choose the five-year-old. And so the best way to respond initially is to say, okay, in order to kind of test and understand what you're suggesting, can I just change the scenario a little bit? Let's imagine that you see a burning building and you can only grab one person out of that burning building. One of the two people in it is a five-year-old you don't know. The other individual is your five-year-old son. Who do you pick? Well, you're gonna grab your son. Now, does that mean the five-year-old stranger is not a human being? No. Does that mean you can directly go in and kill the other five-year-old? No. What that shows is that when we are in um, a, a dilemma where we actually can't save everyone we want to save, that there are multiple factors that in the heat and emotions of the moment that might influence us to choose one party over another party, but the fact that we choose one over the other doesn't mean the other is suddenly unequal and worthy of our direct killing. That there are people who are dying in this city right now None of us are crying about that. But if we get a phone call, one of our loved ones has just died, we're gonna weep. 
well, it's not okay that these people I'm not crying for died. It just shows I have more of an emotional bond. So understanding that, then we can say, okay, so the fact that someone picks a five-year-old over all the embryos, for example, if there were five strangers and only your child, and you could only pick either the five strangers or your child, I think most people would still pick their child over five, 10, or 100 strangers. And so in the same way, if I pick the five-year-old kid over hundreds of embryos, it doesn't mean the embryos aren't human. It doesn't mean it's okay to directly kill the embryos. It's just that when I recognize I can't save everyone, I might be more emotionally connected to this five-year-old child. I might be thinking, well, it's wrong that all of them die in a fire, but I know that the experience for the five-year-old will be consciously one more of suffering than these embryos. It doesn't make it okay, but it's kind of like if you get shot in the head and die immediately versus you're tortured to death. Well, they're both wrong, but it's just, terrible to imagine someone being tortured to death. Um, another factor a pro-lifer might consider is, well, once I get the embryos out, you know, I get the five-year-old out, I take him to my house and feed him. I get the embryos out, yeah, what do I do now? You know, are there wounds for them? Even if there are, is it ethical to implant them? That's a whole other the uh, theological and philosophical debate. And then even if it is, what is the survival rate? So there are multiple factors that might cause us to select the five-year-old over the embryos that doesn't mean the embryo is not human. Any other questions? Raise your hand and Eden will take, take it to you. Just a little touch and it comes on. Thank you for the talk, uh, very enlightening. This perhaps a drop on the video that you showed at the end, uh, just so I could a further question on it. I thought that the gentleman at the end was actually quite, you know, uh, thoughtful and that his reasoning was, was quite sound. Um, and perhaps. The gentleman was, at the end, you're saying the, the overweight man, the older man, or you mean slightly, the young boy? Slightly overweight. Okay, oh, slightly, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, Hope he's not watching. <laughs> uh, so my only thought was, how would you balance the need to tell people who are perhaps brainwashed by the secular worldview around them that, well, killing your child is wrong? Um, and how do you balance that with being loving and compassionate towards them? Good question. Because as far as I could tell, and, and my experience you know, as a young man, might not be the same <coughs> as that young student, but my you know, reaction to the video as well, that was actually a thoughtful response. So perhaps if you could unpack a bit more what you mean by how he could have been better. Sure, yeah, good question. So when he was coming back about the DNA and, you know, it's not your body, it's someone, you know, it's the parent's body, on a technical level, he's right insofar as making the claim that the preborn child is a separate entity from the mom. Where he was wrong was not so much in his content, but his choice of delivering that content. That the moment someone reveals they have gone through a serious trauma and are already showing themselves to not be listening, you're wasting your breath taking, walking down a logical path. Because their issue is not an issue of the head, it's an issue of the heart. Had I been in this conversation and she had not yet revealed that she had gotten pregnant from rape and we were early on in the conversation and I didn't know anything personal about her, yeah, I would have talked about DNA, I would have talked about human rights, I would have been, I would have talked about the preborn child being human because the parents are living because the embryo is growing. But the moment we're going round and round and getting nowhere, or the moment she so explicitly reveals, what that tells me is I'm not getting through to her because she needs to be validated for who she is as a human and that what happened to her was a terrible thing. And until she's properly processed her trauma, I don't even think she's going to accept this conclusion. Now, I'm not a counselor, so I'm not going to try to pretend to be one, but I can be a sympathetic, empathetic Christian. So what I would have done in the moment of reveal would have been to say, I am so sorry for what you went through. How are you doing? Um, uh, uh, in one conversation I had with a woman who revealed, I said to her, do you feel safer as the person who hurt you still in your life? So even, even if you're not dealing with a minor, taking it upon yourself to be concerned for their safety, is, could she be victimized again? Um, has this been properly reported? Um, and then another question would be, do you feel you've gotten adequate counseling? Could I help connect you to a place? Is there something that I could do? Um, another thing, if the person 
was maybe kind of a little antsy towards me because of my pro-life views that had previously been revealed before they shared their personal story, um, I would have said, uh, what, and you, you could say this differently and it come across differently, so you have to say it very gently. What does someone who thinks like you want someone who thinks like me to understand? Or what does someone who's had your experience, what, what do you, rather, who's had your experience, want me, I'll be honest, who hasn't had your experience to understand? So I would set aside all head intellectual stuff and just meet them on a compassionate, empathetic level. And then to give you another example, if we were in a courtroom, that first guy would have been a great lawyer catching her in a technicality. Or the second guy, no, the first guy, because he said, um, uh, she, she, I was a baby, and he said, you weren't a baby, you were 13. Okay, well, if you're in a courtroom, great. You know, catch her on a technicality. That is not what you say to someone in conversation who's revealed that she has been brutalized and overpowered and hurt in the most despicable way. All she needed was not to be called out on that she wasn't baby enough um, and, and just wrapped in empathy and compassion. One thing I would just say too, um, if, if it's man versus woman also, it, um, she may not be wanting to talk too much, so then it's really just an expression of sympathy. I'm sorry for all you've gone through. Um, I wouldn't recommend like a man like touching her arm or anything. Even for women, what I typically do when someone begins to get emotional with me, um, whether they're pro-life or pro-abortion, is, is I say, may I hug you? Are you okay if I put my hand on your arm? Because um, we don't know what that person's story is and what kind of touch, even if it's same-sex touch, will make them feel. So even for the women in the room, I always ask, is it okay if I hug you? Do you want to sit down? Can I put my hand on your shoulder? Yeah, I'm around the rest of the weekend, so I'm happy to talk. Thank you.